Welcome to the Shattered Podcast, and today with me I have Matthew Van Horn. Thank you very much, Matthew, for coming to give your testimony. Thank you for having me. And um, start by telling me uh, a little bit about your childhood. Well, my childhood was, uh, I had a great childhood. <clears throat> I had a mother and father that, that really loved me, loved my brothers. You know, they did the best that they could to... Uh, raise us right and teach us the way of the word uh, Jesus Christ and everything we we went to church every Sunday we were involved um, but my father was in the military so we moved around a lot we moved to a lot of schools and everything and because we didn't get to stay in in one specific area long enough to develop them childhood friendships mm -hmm. that everybody else or well, most people you know, you get to grow up with them when, when right. you're 20, 30 years old. You're still around. You're still friends. We never got that. And uh, so me and my brothers, we were our best friends. And uh, There we, were three of you? There's three of us. I'm the youngest. There's two older ones. Um, because of having that sheltered life almost, you know, we weren't really too much allowed to go to friends' house and go to parties and People weren't really too much allowed to come over because uh, my parents were trying to protect and shelter us. Right. But they, in my eyes, I kind of felt like they did a little too much. And that's really what got me into rebelling against my parents about you can't go, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't have fun. Um, so at the age of 10, me and my brothers uh, living in Colleen, Texas, we used to sneak out of the house at night. Uh, the, we lived in the second story. We would climb out the window, climb onto the garage, and climb down on the picket, the privacy fence, and we would we would run around town and break into cars. And, and how old were you? I was 10 years old. 10. Uh, <clears throat> and one night that we were out is how we got caught. Me and my oldest brother, <clears throat> uh, we were breaking into this Camaro, and uh, we were digging around in the glove box, digging around the car, looking looking for any kind of tobacco, money, anything that we could steal, we could take back home, you know, because we didn't get the niceties, even though my parents, at the time that we were living in this house, was making pretty good money. We didn't get the niceties, we didn't get the... Uh, you know the allowances for doing everything right. our allowance was a roof over our head and food in our stomach mm -hmm. and clothes on our back so you know we we wanted other things that my parents wouldn't allow us to have so that's why we were breaking in the cars trying to steal stuff and uh, this particular night we're in this car breaking into it and uh my brother's in the passenger seat, I'm in the driver's seat, and he just bails out the car and takes off running. And I'm looking at him like, why are you running? I turned to get out of the car, take off running myself, and I got a shotgun in my face. The owner. <clears throat> the owner of the car. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they pulled me over to the apartment complex, and they were like, you need to call your parents or call the cops. I was definitely afraid of my dad. <laughs> I was not calling my dad at three o'clock in the morning to let him know I'm snuck out of, snuck the, house. Out of the house. So <laughs> trying to be a tough guy at 10 years old, I tell him, I said, call the cops. So we're sitting around waiting for about 10 minutes and I start getting scared now. So I'm like, I want to call my mom and dad. <laughs> so I had to wake my mom and dad up in the middle of the night and tell them, you know, that I'm over here man. and the cops are coming. Yeah. I'm probably going to jail. So that was my first encounter with the police at 10 years old. Uh, Try to scare tactic. They put me in handcuffs, put me in the back of the cop car, and uh, let me sit there for a while. But my mom and dad wound up taking me back home. So they, there was no charges filed. There was no charges filed. Um, <clears throat> mom and dad really didn't whoop my butt behind it. They figured, you know, because I was the youngest, my two older brothers were out with me, that they influenced me to do that. In kind of a way they did, but I I pretty much pressured them, you're going to let me go with you, because I found out what they were doing. You're going to let me go with you. How old were your brothers? 
Um, okay, I'm about you were turn 10 36, at the time. so yeah. 11 and 13. Oh, they were like one and two years older yeah, than Yeah, they're you. just a year and two years older than me. And, uh, you know, we moved, we moved from Killeen because of that little incident and then a, another little incident that had nothing to do with us. My parents were like, yeah, we're going to move out of this town. So we moved to Gatesville, Texas, a little country town. <clears throat> My parents thinking, okay, you know, being out of town, mm -hmm. being out of the city limits, you won't have them influences like that. We couldn't get in trouble. We'll be out in the country. Well, that's where we all lost our virginity at a young age and got introduced to drugs. Um, I was 14 years old. First time I tried marijuana. I uh, snuck out of the house again. Uh, my brothers lived in a camper outside of the house. You know, they're getting a little older, so my mom was like, we're going to give you a little freedom. We've got this camper. Y'all can live in that. So they were living in the camper, and I snuck out there, and they were out there smoking weed. And uh, I decided that I wanted to smoke too. It wasn't a peer pressure thing. It's just... I guess just because I really looked up to my brothers, and mm -hmm. I... I wanted to be like my brothers a lot, right. but they didn't pressure me into it. They actually tried to get me not to, but me being a hard-headed kid that I was, <laughs> you weren't going to stop me from doing nothing. Right. So yeah, I started smoking weed with them, <clears throat> started uh, started actually getting little sacks of weed here and there and taking it to school, smoking, smoking weed at school. Um, I think I was about... 15 years old, I had actually got arrested at school. Uh, I had about six cops come to school. I had started riots at school. Um, you had started a riot at school? I did. It was between me and my two older brothers and the whole football team. And I uh, wound up getting suspended a couple times. Well, they wound up kicking me out of school. I mean, why, why did you start the riot? Why it started that? Well, the riot actually started because uh, me and a friend, we were sitting at the cafeteria table, and we were spitting spit wads at each other. Well, he spit one at me, and I dodged it and hit the kid behind me. I had a straw in my mouth, so I turned around and looked at him, and he's like, why would you spit, spit a spit wad at me? I'm like, I didn't. And he said, yeah, you did. And he slapped the straw out of my mouth. Well, I... I shoved him back. When I shoved him, he grabbed my feet and threw my feet up, threw me up under the table, and he jumped on me. My middle brother sitting a couple tables over. He seen it, so he jumped up on the tables and came running at him, knocked him off of me, so they start fighting. When I get out from under the table, another one of the football players, he jumps up, and me and him go to fighting, and then probably another 10 more football players it jump up. It just escalated from It there. just escalated. Over and, uh, something so silly. Something so stupid. Well, I got blamed for it. You know, I, my very first day at this school, I was already accused of being in a gang and everything just because the way I dressed and the way I acted coming from a big city to a small country right. town. And uh, so that little incident happened. I got kicked out of school beginning of my 10th grade year. Um went to homeschooling. I finished the last three years of my homeschool, uh, of schooling in homeschool. And uh, I just, I was just a very rebellious, very hard to control child. Around this age, I was constantly fighting. We already started drinking. And uh, my two older brothers moved <coughs> out of the house. <coughs> um, while I was still living at the house, I had actually started sneaking out of the house at night and breaking into houses around around the country town that we lived in. By yourself? By myself. And I started getting so bold as to breaking into houses while people were there. There's this one time that I think this is what draw the line with my parents and me living at the house. An ex-girlfriend of mine, I went over to her house she didn't live there no more, and I knew where all the guns were. And I snuck into her house while her dad was asleep on the couch. 
and I'm walking walking back and forth by him while he's sleeping on the couch, stealing guns out of his, his gun cabinet. And uh, thought I got away with it. You know, got clean, away from the house and everything, didn't get caught. I had the pistol in my sock drawer, and a friend of mine came over to the house <clears throat> and asked me if I wanted to go to a basketball game with him that night. And I told him, yeah, I'd go. And I wanted to show the gun off, so I went and showed it to him. And uh, he actually took the gun from me that night. I didn't know it. So we went to we went to the basketball game. We're drinking, uh, drinking liquor, tequila, and I can't even remember what the other drink was we were drinking, but we were drinking a lot. And uh, on the way home from the basketball game, we had a wreck. He told his car, and I'm scrambling. We he wrecked the car up underneath the bridge, wrapped the car around the pillar underneath the bridge, and. Uh, I go to try to get all the liquor out of the car, and he's like, don't worry about the liquor. Get the gun out of the car. I'm like, what gun? And he told me that pistol that I had, he took it. So you stole it, and then he stole it and from he you. he stole it from me. So the wrecker that shows up is actually a friend of the family, and I told him about the pistol and the liquor. And he told me to go put it in his truck. So I put it all in his truck. Well, his son is a friend that we grew up with in school. So they towed the car. <clears throat> Nothing happened to us. We got away. Um, so I called I called his son up one night, and I told him, I said, I need that pistol back. And he's like, I can't give it to you. My dad's got it. I'm like, well, I need that pistol back. And he said, I can't. My dad already gave it to the cops. They ran the serial num number on it, found out that it was stolen. They found out whose it was and I had to admit to it. So I went to jail behind that. And you, you're 16 at this time? I was 15, 16 15. years old. I got caught for that, and my mom and dad actually came and bonded me out. The one and only time that they ever bonded me out of jail, they bonded me out. And while I was on bond, I went over to a another girl's house out there that we lived, lived by us. And uh, it was late at night, and uh, I went into her bedroom. You know, we sat and talked. Well, her stepdad seen me leaving, so he called the cops and filed criminal trespassing on me. So I went back to jail for that one while I was on bond. And it just it just became a domino effect of getting in trouble with the laws. I was under the radar, couldn't get out from underneath their radar. They were watching you. They were watching me, and uh, you had made that name for yourself. I did, and uh, my parents were like, "We just we can't handle this no more." Constantly having cops come out to the house, knocking on the door. We're looking for Matthew Van Horn. My mom hid me out one time. Uh, she was just so sick of them coming out, picking me up, no. taking me to jail. She's like, "No, it's not happening today." Uh, it just got to the point where they were like, we can't deal with you no more. We need to move out. So I moved out, moved in with my brothers. They had a, an apartment in town. Well, when I get out to the apartment, come to find out that they're using crystal meth and selling it. And that's how they were making their money and paying their bills and stuff. And because... I had access to a farm truck, and they didn't have a vehicle. I became their their transportation, their run guy. You did their mule. Their mule. But I wanted to, and that was actually the first time I was 16, 16 years old, the first time I ever tried methamphetamines. And, uh, you know, we we sold meth for another another guy, and he was actually getting his meth from the sheriff and the drug task force. And, uh, you know, we'd get the heads up anytime they were doing stings or doing raids. We'd get the heads up to clean house. Right. And, uh... There was a level of corruption there. There was. <clears throat> um, you know, we did that for probably 
six months until the sheriff and the drug task force actually got caught smuggling drugs in cattle. And that's how they were transporting it. Uh, 18 wheeler with their brand on it, jackknifed on the road and cattle spilled out of the, the 18 wheeler and started crapping out dope and weed and they had their brand on it. So <clears throat> the sheriff and the drug task force. The cattle. And that poor cattle. They used them to, to transport. transport the drugs. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, when they got caught, they they made both of them resign. You know, neither one of them got any jail time. They got a big fine and made them resign. And everything was hunky-dory with it. You know, they didn't get to see no prison time or anything. Wow. But, uh... And they should have. And they, yes, they should have. Cause they're people just like I was, mm -hmm. but because they were had a name for themselves, known around town, just just resign and here's a fine, pay this fine, yeah. and you're you're gonna be all right. So <clears throat> after that happened, you know, it put a lot of heat on on us and everything. We pretty much got ran out of town. So we moved and moved to Longview, Texas, <clears throat> and uh. Quit doing, quit doing drugs. You know, I still smoked weed on a daily basis. Uh, I got to where I was smoking almost two ounces of weed a day, still selling weed, uh, maintaining jobs and everything, but only for short periods. Wow. You know, I was making more money selling weed than I would working eight to five. So uh, we moved to Longview, Texas, and. I think I was 18, 19 years old, the first time I got introduced to crack cocaine. And uh, started smoking crack heavily on a daily basis. And uh, I smoked it for almost two years. I had got with this this girl that I wound up marrying. Uh, she was the one that introduced me to the crack cocaine. Uh, we moved from Longview, Texas to Paris, Texas, and uh, I was going out stealing, uh, stealing people's checks, writing hot checks, uh, let me see, uh, I was actually robbed dope dealers, I would kick in their door, rob them, um, take their dope. This one time <clears throat> in the middle of our addiction, we had left Paris, Texas and came back to Gatesville, Texas and moved back in with my mom and dad, me and my soon-to-be wife. We weren't married at the time yet, but we had moved back to Gatesville, Texas with my parents staying in their house. And while I was there, I got a job at this uh, feed store. And... Uh, the owner, I want to say his grandson, one day told me, he's like, man, I want to come show you something real quick. So he took me in the office, and underneath the table, there's like five briefcases lined up under the table. And he's like, check this out. So he pulls a briefcase out, pops it open, it's full of money bags, unzips one, and it's just money all up in these briefcases. Pulls a couple hundred dollars out, hands it to me, he puts some in his pocket and puts it back under the table and we go back into the back where all the feed is and he's like, I've always wanted to rob my uncle. So he got me to thinking, I can do this. I can rob him and get away with it. There's no surveillance on this building. There's no security from when you open the door or anything. I could do this. Well, I didn't tell him this. Um, then a couple truckers come up there, drop off feed, they'd leave their wallets in the truck. I'd snatch all their money out of their wallet, put their wallet back in the truck. Nothing was ever said about it. Um, uh, my wife had, my, at the time, my girlfriend had actually became pregnant. So I'm back and forth with her to the hospital, taking her, <clears throat> missing a lot of work. When my boss tell me, he's like, man, you're missing a lot of work. I told him, I said, I can't, I can't do nothing about it. You know, I got to get her to the hospital. Mm -hmm. 
And he's like, I told him, I said, so what do you want to do about it? He said, well, I'm going to have to let you go. Okay, I can deal with that. So he lets me go. About two months go by. <clears throat> I had already been scoping the business out. What time they get there in the morning, how how many people's going to be there before more people show up. Right. And uh, I'm at the house one morning with my girlfriend, and I decide I'm going to do it. So I get up early in the morning, about 5 o'clock in the morning. And I told her, I said, I'm going to go to town, and I'll be back in a little bit. She's like, what are you going to do? I said, don't worry about what I'm going to do. Just I'm going to be back in a little bit. And she, know, she knew me. <clears throat> We've been together about two years. She's like, no, you're not going unless you tell me what you're doing. So she kind of she kind of made me tell her. So I told her what I was going to do. <clears throat> told her I was about to go to this, this feed store and about to rob him. And uh, she's like, you're not going to go unless you take me with you. So I'm like, I don't want her involved in this. Because she's pregnant. Well, she actually had a miscarriage oh, okay. bef right before all this. Um, my thing was, is with me and my brothers, we didn't do dirt with nobody. Mm -hmm. Unless we did it between the three of us, right. we did dirt by ourselves. Can't tell on ourselves. And mm -hmm. me and my brothers wouldn't tell on each other. And I was like, I don't want her going with me. But she was like, you're not going to go unless I go with you. So we sat there for a minute, and I was finally, I was, I was trying to think of a way I could use her without putting her in any kind of danger or anything, and I figured out how I was going to do it. Because my boss actually used to have the hots for my, my girlfriend. I mean, she wasn't a bad-looking woman. So I told her, I said, go in there and put the most provocative thing you can find on. You know, very skimpy, very short, mm -hmm. showing some stuff. I said, go put it on. I said, I know what I'm going to have you do. She was like, okay. So she went and got, got put on these booty shorts and the spaghetti string shirt on and everything. Went to town. I told her, I said, look, I'm going to pull up. I'm going to park the car. You're going to park the car. I'm going to have you drive. I said, go in. When you go in, just leave the door open and just draw his attention. And uh, this is what you're going to have to say. I had found another job, and I left my sunglasses and gloves in the back. Wanted to know if they're still there. Try to get him out of the front room. So she did, and they he wound up taking her to the back. That was my opportunity to slip into the business. I grabbed the briefcase, came back out, and I told her, when you come back out, there's going to be a briefcase in the floorboard. Just take off driving and pick me up down the road. Well, she, I mean, everything went perfect. Didn't get caught and had no complications. She wound up leaving. Picked me back up. Almost almost a year, year and a half had went by. And I, I before, before the year and a half went by, I told her, I said, the cops are going to come talk to you because you were there. I said, but you got a legitimate excuse. Mm -hmm. You were in his presence the entire time, so he can't blame you for it. And, uh, you know, she stuck to the story. <clears throat> and uh, her story and his story, they added up, so everything was dropped with her. They didn't even come question me because I wasn't seen. Right. You know, there's no cameras there, so we pretty much got away with it. I got almost uh, $8,000 in cash. I had his land title, business title, about $120,000 in checks. But I always wanted just the cash so I burnt everything else and uh, my mom and dad got this thing they record phone calls coming in and out of their house and I used to tell her watch what you say on that phone well me and her get into it one day she calls her mom and she goes telling her mom everything exactly how we did it and everything my mom and dad happened to check the, the recorder and they they heard the whole conversation. So I get home one day, and my mom and dad tell me, they said, uh, we got something we want to ask you. Actually, we want, got something we want you to listen to and tell us what you think about it. So <clears throat> they told me, they said, go get Jackie and 
bring her into the living room. Let's listen to this. Well, I seen the recorder and I knew what it was. They go to push play and it's her telling her mom exactly how the robbery went down and everything. And, uh, you know, it pissed me off. My mom and dad's like, what do you think we should do about it? And I'm like, I want that tape. And they said, well, we've already sent it off to the off to the sheriff's office. They're probably listening to it right now. You got five minutes to get whatever you can get and get out of our house. <clears throat> so I went on the run. Uh, wound up going to state jail. Did, did a year and a half in state jail. Over that. Over that and uh, some hot checks, uh, forgery <clears throat> that I did while I was in Paris, Texas. Um, let me see. Bef- actually, before we left Paris, Texas, I had actually OD'd on crack cocaine. I was in my deathbed. I um, hope you don't mind me backing up a little bit. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I had actually OD'd. I had robbed a dope, a dope dealer for almost two ounces of crack cocaine, and uh, me, her, and her mom, and her mom's little boyfriend, I guess you would call him, and we stayed up all night smoking weed, smoking crack, drinking beer. I had uh, I had got sick. I was feeling very sick. I told her I wasn't feeling very well, and we probably already ran through maybe an ounce of crack already. And I told her, I said, I'm going to go lay down on the bed because I'm not feeling very well. So I get up, and the way our our kitchen is set up in my bedroom was, my bedroom door leads right into the kitchen. So I go in the bedroom, and it's nice and cool. It's dark. I lay down on the bed. <clears throat> I'm laying back, trying to relax, trying to, trying to get my composure back, trying to not feel so bad. And, you know, I'm starting to feel better. And, uh... There's a very distinct sound when you smoke crack. There's a little sizzling, popping that goes on. So I hear him, I hear him start smoking again. I didn't want to miss out. I'm an addict. So I jump up out of the bed. As soon as I walk out of the threshold door of the bedroom, I black out. I fall, bust my head open. I come to, I'm leaned up against the wall, and I'm looking at her mom, and her mom's saying something to me, but I can't understand what she's saying. I can't hear nothing. I can barely see, and she grabs me and jerks me up off the floor, and I black out again. I probably wake up almost 18 hours later. I'm laying on the bed, and uh, my my wife, I'm going to say she's my wife, but we haven't got married yet. But she's sitting on the floor with her knees up to her chest, wrapped around her, her legs, rocking back and forth, just saying, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I reach over and touch her and scare the crap out of her. But one thing I noticed is when uh when I snapped out of it, I looked at the clock on the radio, and it said 3.33 a.m. And uh, she was like, you were dead. You had no pulse. You were not breathing. You were you were dead. I'm like, I'm fine. I don't feel I don't feel bad. She's like, No, you were dead. You were not breathing. So, okay, four back. <clears throat> um before we robbed that business, my mom actually told me she, and I hadn't seen my parents in almost two years and we're about four hundred miles away. Mm-hmm. My mom, like I said, they're very spiritual people. Uh she said I want to tell you something. About six to eight months ago, me and your dad were laying in the bed. And uh, she said, I had this dream, this vision, that you were laying on this bed. My mom described my bedroom to the T, where the bed was, the tent full over the window, where the radio was sitting in the room. She said, I had this vision of you laying on the bed and the demon sitting on top of your chest choking you. And she said that she woke up and rolled off the bed and started praying. My dad had the same vision, and he got up and he started praying. She said they prayed for about four hours. And uh, in the middle of their prayer, they had a vision again of that demon lifting up off my chest, going across the room, and then going up into a woman that's standing in the doorway. That woman was my wife's mom at the time. 
and they said that it was about 3.33 a.m. Wow. that they they felt that I was okay, and they quit praying. And uh, so all that happened, and then forward back to more after, after my mom and dad kicked us out of the house, I went to jail, state jail. I got 18 months of state jail. I did my sentence. I had got out. <clears throat> my mom came and picked me up, and uh, she brought me back to the house. Well, they had moved from the farm that we had to a house in, in town. Well, they let me live with them, try to get on my feet. Well, my dad was in Iraq at this time. And, uh, you know, if my dad's not there, we can kind of run over my mom a little bit. Right. So we did. Um, I had picked up a trade while I was in, in state jail. I was tattooing. Made a lot of money at it, so why not do it out here? So I was making pretty good money at tattooing. Well, the tattooing draws in the wrong kind of crowd, wrong kind of people. Um, I'm tattooing at my mom's house. Uh, wind up getting hooked up with a, another woman. Me and my wife had split. I hadn't seen her the whole time I was locked up. Got out, didn't see her. I got hooked up with another girl who's actually becomes my the mother of my son. But <clears throat> Probably about a week to maybe two weeks after I was out of jail. The whole time I was in state jail, it's nothing but fighting every day. Uh, I liked fighting. I liked violence. And uh, it just became, well, in that kind of environment, somebody touches you or hits mm -hmm. you, you hit back. So me and my mom got <clears throat> got into an argument one one day. My wife had actually called me up. I don't know how she got my phone number. She called me up and she was wanting me to come pick her up and bring her back to Gatesville to go to court. So I tell my mom about it. My mom's like, no, you're not going to get her. At this time, I'm 21, I think. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm a grown man. You can't tell me what I can and can't do. Right. This is my wife. I'm gonna go pick her up. Yeah. My mom was telling me, no, you're not. Uh, we kind of get into a little heated argument. And uh, I had a very foul mouth at the time. And, you know, I said the F word in front of her face. And she's like, you better not say that again. And I said, I'm a grown effing man. And I'll say F if I want to. So my mom smacks me. Well, I instantly reacted and I slapped her back. When I did, I slapped her into the wall, and she slid down the wall, and she started screaming for my, screaming for my dad. Uh, <clears throat> my dad comes in into the hallway and sees my mom on the floor and everything, and he's like, "Get out of my house! I'm calling the cops." So I left, went on the run again. I thought the cops were gonna be chasing me. Uh, still, to this day, I don't know if they called the cops or not. But I went over to a. a a friend's house staying with him and his mom and she asked she asked me one night after, like two nights after I was there she could tell there's something wrong with me something bothering me mm -hmm. you know I felt really bad for hitting my mom yeah. I've, I've never done nothing like that before and it was eating at me and she asked me she's like what's going on with you I wouldn't tell her so she called my mom and dad my mom and dad told her what was up she made me, <laughs> she made me go home and go apologize to my mom. I went home and my mom had a neck brace on and the side of her face was bruised and it really broke me down. Well, they wound up letting me move back in. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, I, started, I was still selling weed, still smoking a lot of weed and everything, still drinking and uh, buying a couple pounds at a time, selling it. I started having these little Hawaiian kids. They they would come over, and they would just hang out at the house. My mom liked them. You know, they were very respectful kids. They were young. They were like 14, 15, 16 years old, riding bicycles. And I would give them sacks of weed and have them go sell it for me and bring me the money back. You know, I was 
that's the thing. They're minors. They won't go to jail. Right. Give it to the minors. Let the minors minors take care of it. Plus, they were they were minors, but they were some big kids, and they wouldn't take no. I mean, you're gonna give them the money, or right. they'd beat you up. Well, <clears throat> uh, me and my middle brother had gotten into a couple fights at the house. Uh, I had actually beat on him a little too much one night. He went into a seizure. They had rushed him to the hospital. Uh, me and him got back into smoking crack again. I used to sneak into my mom's room and steal her debit card out of her wallet at night and go draw $500 at a time out of their, their ATM account. Why not steal an almost $3,500 from them before I actually knew exactly how much money I took. So I quit doing it. Figure, okay, my dad makes pretty good money. They're not gonna miss that. He found out, he knew. As soon as he got home from Iraq, he found out there was $3,500 missing yeah. out of his account. You know, who did it? I had to admit to it, I did it. Well, he kicked all of us out of the house and uh, said he was calling the cops. So I'm on the run again. <clears throat> uh, I'm living at a crackhead's house you know, squatting there and smoking crack with them, still running around at night, stealing stuff. Um, I had got chased by the cops one night, and uh, my girlfriend at the time, I didn't know, I don't know how she found me, because I never told her where I was staying at. I was really trying to avoid her. Well, she, I'm asleep in the bed, and she pops up in the bedroom one morning and woke me up. And, uh, you know, she told me she's pregnant and that she was leaving town and if I ever wanted to see my kid that I would leave with her. So, you know, I tell my brother, I said, man, I'm leaving. And he's like, where are you going? I said, I'm not telling you. I'm not telling nobody where I'm going, but I'm leaving because I've always wanted a child and I'm not going to miss this opportunity to be a part of a child, uh, have a, have a kid with somebody. So... I packed up and I left with her. She was doing it for one reason, really, is to try to get me off the drugs. And uh, you know, I took a little bit of drugs with me in my pocket, stayed messed up a little bit, but once we got to Comanche, Texas, and the drugs ran out, she was trying to get me clean, get me off the drugs. I had wound up getting a job uh, doing custom tile work Telling my boss, you know, I'm on the run. Cops are looking for me. I can't do the check thing to do, yeah. do cash. So he knew I was on the run, so he started kind of screwing me over on my pay. And uh, I had a pregnant woman plus her mom and two other little girls living in the house. You know, I'm the only one working. You know, I got to take care of them. Plus, I got to take care of myself and bills. Well, he's not wanting to pay me. He wound up running almost $1,800 up that he owed me, wow. and I got tired of it. And I was one of those kind of people, you take me off, I'm going to get you. So I went to work one morning, and I decided today's the day I'm going to get him. And uh, the place that I was working at is actually maybe 200 yards from where his house was, and he just dropped me off and went to the house. I knew he was at his house. <clears throat> I walked over to his house and uh, knocked on the door. He answered the door. Um, I asked him, I said, man, uh, when am I going to get paid for the money that you owe me? And he's like, I don't owe you no money. I'm like, really? So I had a little box cutter knife almost kind of like almost kind of like one of these I had took it out of my back pocket and I had opened it up and I had it open ready but when he's talking about he wasn't going to pay me I shoved him off in the house and I took that box cutter to his to his neck and I held him down on the couch and I was I was that close to killing him because he wouldn't pay me more money did you cut him I didn't cut him 
you just come close to it? I was I was wanting to, and uh, something was holding me back. At the time, I didn't know what was holding me back, but I can tell you now that I know it was Jesus Christ that was holding me back. It was my guardian angel holding me back. Mm -hmm. um, he had surveillance cameras all on the inside of his house and outside of his house. If I'd have killed him, I, I would not have got away with it. Wow. Well, I wound up robbing him, <clears throat> and uh, um, stealing everything, taking it back to the house. You know, I let him go. Didn't hurt him or nothing. I wound up taking uh, taking a pistol. Uh, taking some change that he had in a jar, just whatever I could take to try to make up for what right. he pretty much took from me. And uh, took it back to the house, let him go. Well, he wound up calling the cops and gave them the video footage and everything and had it set up to get me back over to the house so they could arrest me. So he comes over to the house. I leave... I leave, go home, tell my tell my girl, it's like, man, I, she was wondering why I'm home early. I said, no, nah, I think I got fired. And she was, you know, she was pissed off, kind of tripping, but I didn't tell her what all happened. Well, later on, my boss shows up at the house, knocks on the door, answers the door, and I'm like, what are you doing here? And he said, man, I need you to come back and finish this job because you're the only one to do this tile work, and I need it finished and I'm gonna write you a check for everything that I owe you, and I want my stuff back. So I was like, man, I don't want a check, because if you write me a check, you're just gonna cancel the check on me. You know, what's gonna stop you from doing that? And he's like, man, I promise you I'll pay you everything that I owe you, I just need you to come finish this job. So I did, I load back up in the truck, you know, she kind of forced me to go. I go get back in the truck with him, go back over there, and one way in, one way out, building. I'm all the way in the back. Uh, he left me. Uh, he left me in the back, and he walked to the front, and I just started getting butterflies. You know, something, something's not right. Yeah. So I decided, you know what? I don't care about the money. I don't care about this. She can be pissed off. I'm leaving. I'm trying to go out the front, and he's up front on the phone. I start to walk out the front door, and he's like, where are you going? I, was like, I told him, I said, man, I'm about to go use the bathroom. He's like, well, hold on, hold on a minute, come here. He's trying to keep me in the building. Two cop cars pulled up, said they got a phone call, you know, this and that. I wound up getting charged with, uh, I think, burglary or criminal trespassing or something. Anyway, all my other charges that I've been running for him caught up with me, <clears throat> and, uh, I wound up getting a five-year probation while I was there, <clears throat> and I had to be transferred back over to Corio County. When I got over there, they gave me an eight-year probation. So I had two probations running concurrent, a five-year and an eight-year. Wow. That probation didn't last very long. It lasted maybe a month, and they were wanting way too much, $600 a month for one, 400 something dollars for another. I'm like, I'm not going to pay that. I'd rather just go to prison. Uh, so I did, and I wound up doing eight years in prison, eight years flat in Texas prison. I got out. I went to prison in 2007. I got out in 2015. When I got out in 2015, uh, you know, I had intentions of doing right. Right. I just didn't have the will to do right. You know, I'm still lost. The whole time I was in prison, I wasn't a Christian. You know, I was raised Christian, but I wasn't a Christian. Uh, I actually hated Christians. I couldn't stand them. I couldn't stand anything they were about. I would run cellies. They'd come in. They'd start pulling their Bibles and stuff out. I'd run them out of the cell. I don't want you in here. Right. I had a big problem with Christians. <clears throat> and... Uh, after I got out, I wound up getting a job. My, my oldest brother helped me get a job. My uncle gave me a 22-foot fifth-wheel hitch camper to live in. Him, my mom and dad, you know, they tried helping me out. 
I was doing pretty good there for a little bit. I had been clean all them years, except for smoking weed. I still smoked weed while I was in prison. But I hadn't touched no hard drugs. And I had no intentions to. Well, I wound up getting hooked up with another girl. Seems to be my downfall. <laughs> but uh, I wound up getting hooked up with another girl that actually went to my mom and dad's church. And, uh, you know, she was she was doing methamphetamines, the new drug that's out that I, I had never been introduced to called ICE. Right. Still another methamphetamine, but I've never seen it before. And, uh, you know, I got hooked up with her and uh, moved into her apartment, moved my camper and everything. And, uh, you know, she asked me one day, she was like, do you want to make more money? I'm like, I'm always down to make more money. What are we going to do? And she's mm-hmm. like, sell some ice. I'm like, yeah, I can sell dope. I'm good at that. So uh, we take one of my paychecks and we go get a quarter ounce of dope. So we start selling dope around town, doing pretty good at it. I try it, start shooting dope up again. That was my, that was the way I like to do it. I like to put it in the needle and shoot it up. And, uh, you know, after we started, started using, she was already using before I, I started using. Mm-hmm. Once I started using, work was out of the question. I'd rather just sell dope, do tattoos, you know, make more money at it. Right. And uh, it caused a lot of tr- problems between me and her. Uh, we wound up splitting up. <clears throat> I moved to Austin, Texas. By this time, I'm strung out on, on ice. Uh, I'm living on the streets in Austin. I had a car, I wound up wrecking it, and so now I'm walking on foot now, so I'm actually living out of a backpack, walking around Austin. Uh, Times got really hard when I was living in Austin. I would actually, you know, you hear people say it, but I actually lived it. I actually ate out of dumpsters. Yeah. Um, Sleeping by, in front of convenience stores, people would wake me up, handing me food, I uh, thought I'd never get that low. You know, I come from a family, it's, I come from a good family. I come from a family, that, you know, they don't have a lot of money, but they live good. Right. There's no reason why I should have ever been like that. Mm-hmm. But that's how far my addiction had got me. It took me down that low. I uh, probably had maybe two, two changes of clothes. Uh, you know, you see people on the streets with them cardboard signs. Right. They call it flying a sign. I've done that. That is some of the most embarrassing stuff you could ever do. Right. Uh, I've begged. Uh, my addiction took me down some very dark holes. Uh, I wind up catching up with a friend that I was in prison with in Austin. He's in his addiction, he sold dope. And uh, he wound up taking me down to Houston, Texas with him, <clears throat> him and his cousin and one of his friends. And uh, they were down there to go pick up a couple pounds of dope. While we were there, they wound up robbing me and leaving me in, Austin, in Houston, in a town that I've never been to, don't know where I'm at, don't have a phone. They, they robbed me for everything. Um, I wound up making it back to Austin. And then from Austin, I wind up making it back up to Longview, Texas, to where a lot of my family live. I went to family, I went to uh, Longview, Texas, because that's where my ex-wife, that's where the last time I knew she lived in. So I actually went up there to, to Longview to go see if I could find her. But uh, before before I even made it to Longview, while I was still living in Austin, I got hooked up with this guy, and uh, he taught me a new trade of how to break into soda machines, which I was making really good money at. Uh, 
there's more money in soda machines than you you would actually think. And How I much got, would you get at any one time per machine? You know, I was getting anywhere between 300 to 2,500. Really? Per machine. I did that for about 14 months. I was I was living pretty good off of it. Hmm. And uh, so that's what that's what I was using to get my money to get bus tickets and buy my dough and food and everything was soda machines. And I I kind of figured you know if I'm hitting a soda machine I'm not breaking into somebody's house. Not putting nobody's life in danger. Right. That's how you justified it. That's how I justified it. Mm -hmm. And plus, I was also justifying it like this, too. It's Coca-Cola, multi-billion dollar company. They're not going to miss a couple hundred bucks. Right. That's a plate of food for them. You know, I'm trying to justify it, but it's still wrong. And uh, so I get to Longview. In my addiction, everybody hates me. Nobody's trying to help me out. Not looking at, you know. You burned a lot of bridges. I'm the one that's messed up. Right. I'm looking at it like y'all are messed up mm -hmm. for not helping me. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, they didn't have these things when I first got locked up. This is this is a new toy to me. I'm still trying to learn how to <laughs> use these. Uh, Facebook. I'm sleeping underneath the 18-wheeler in the snow. It's uh it's December 2000, 2015. I put a post on Facebook, took a picture of me sleeping underneath this 18 wheeler and I said this uh Merry Christmas to all those who say they care but really don't. A friend of mine that that I told you that I went to his house and his mom made me go back to my yeah. mom and dad's house and apologize. I hadn't seen him in about 16 years. He's seen my post. And uh, I guess some, there's some way you can get my phone number or whatever, but he actually calls me up on my phone. Tell me, he said, where you at? I'm like, well, hello to you too. He's like, where you at? So I tell him, I said, I'm in Longview, Texas. He said, you're about two hours from me. He said, I'm coming to pick you up. So I'm like, okay. So two hours later, I get a phone call. He said, where are you at? I'm here. <clears throat> I told him, I said, well, 259 and Highway 80, I'll be, uh, I'll be at the gas station. So I walk over to the gas station. Sure enough, he pulls up. And he said, you got all your stuff. I'm taking you home with me. I said, well, I ain't got nothing. All I got this bag right here. He's like, throw it in the truck. I'm taking you home with me. So he brings me up to uh, Valiant, Oklahoma. First time I've ever been in Oklahoma in my life. <clears throat> um, when I get up there, you know, he's trying to get me clean. I stayed with him for probably three months, maybe. The whole time I was with him, I didn't do no dope. You know, I had got a job, lost it, got another job, got fired because I got too many tattoos don't make no sense but um, I started started tattooing again <clears throat> uh, he was let him and his wife were letting me drive her car because they had both got new cars so they had an extra car to let me drive around on well I got pulled over a couple times just on some BS mm -hmm. you know I wasn't doing that wrong one of them was a random pullover Another one I got pulled over, the second one I got pulled over because the tags were out on this vehicle, which he told me they weren't, they weren't out, they were still good. Well, come to find out they weren't. I got pulled over, got a ticket for it, so I'm telling him about it. Well, his wife kind of got a little, you know, why do you keep getting pulled over? Right. Well, I'm not doing nothing wrong. Well, we wound we will up getting into it, and I told him, I said, you know what, I ain't got to deal with this, I'm leaving. I left and went to Broken Bow. And uh, got hooked back up with the drugs again. Went over there and started selling drugs, started running around at night, breaking into soda machines. And uh, got hooked up with a couple people I shouldn't have. And uh, 
started crossing state lines. I would come over here to D. Queen, Arkansas, broke into a couple over here, driving back down to Texas, breaking into submachines down there, then Broken Bow, Valiant, Ida Bell, just trying to get money when I could so I could buy more dope with. Yeah. And uh, wound up getting arrested one night in Ida Bell. Uh, me and another guy had him letting me, had him helping me. He was supposed to be keeping watch and he was rather watching me instead of watching out for the cops. The cops rolled up on us. He got away, I got arrested. Um, wound up, the girlfriend that I had at the time, I'm not gonna mention her name or nothing about her, but the girlfriend I had at the time, <clears throat> she wound up bonding me out. She put up $5,000 cash, her car title, uh, to come bond me out. And uh, I was actually on the phone with her trying to tell her, don't bond me out, just leave me in here. She, yeah. she didn't want to talk to me at the time. She's like, I'm in the middle of doing something. Ten minutes later, they're telling me to pack my stuff up, and I got bonded out. I was like, why did you do that? <laughs> you know, I didn't want to get bonded out. <clears throat> so I'm back out on the street again. I'm living in uh, living in motels, living out of my car, and uh, still on dope, still breaking into soda machines, not trying to do right, and uh, wound up getting arrested again one night. I was leaving to go to Texas, Canada to go break into soda machines, and before I had actually left Idabel, I got pulled over, and uh, the same cop that arrested me the first night. The same cop pulled me over that night, and because I had a drill in my car, which is the tool that I was using to break into soda machines, mm. he he charged me for possession of burglary instrument. So he wound up taking me back to jail. I wound up getting uh, I wound up getting seven and a half years prison time in Oklahoma. And I discharged my time over there. While I was over there, Arkansas had their charges on me, so whenever I discharged from over there, <clears throat> Arkansas came and picked me up. And uh, they brought me over here, and this is when I got introduced to uh, Andrew Mills. Uh, very first day in the E-Pod. Um, once you walked into that pod, you can actually feel a presence in there, a calm, a peace. And uh, that night, Andrew Mill, he came up to me and he started telling me about Got Time. Uh, telling me about, you know, they do Bible study. They do services every night there in the pod. They do Bible study every morning. I was, you know, I've heard all this stuff before. I done yeah. did 13 years in prison. You know, I've heard all this. All right. Well, that night I heard him down there preaching. I, actually, I came down to be part of it, and I heard him preaching. And Andrew Mills has got a blessing on his life that is out of this world. You know, he's he's lived the same kind of life I've lived. Absolutely. And uh, that night I gave my life to God. December 17, 2018, I gave my life to God, and uh, I meant it. And... Uh, started becoming a part uh, part of the Got Time ministry inside the jail. Um, before Andrew was going to go to prison, he asked me, him and Shamario Daniels, they were, they were pretty much the two that were running it the time that I got in there. Mm -hmm. uh, they asked me if I wanted to start preaching with them. You know, I was kind of hesitant at first, but you know, they kind of like hyped me up a little, I guess. So I agreed to, you know, they prayed over me, laid hands on me. And uh, we started sharing nights, you know, like Andrew would speak one night, right. I'd speak the next night. So we did that for, did that for about four and a half months in the county jail. Um, I've had a couple guys on the nights that I would speak, I've had a couple guys give their life to God. Really? And Showed uh, how powerful your voice was to them. 
once something like that happens to you, I got chills mm -hmm. talking about it. Once something like that happens to you, there is no high greater right. than witnessing somebody give their life to God yeah. in front of you as, as, as powerful. No drug can ever make that high mm -hmm. like that. Uh, seeing that <clears throat> and having people come up to me and telling me, you know, I appreciate, appreciate yeah. the word. I mean, you touched me. I can't, I take no credit for any of it. I just give God all the glory for it. Right. Uh, it's, it's really changed my life a lot. Uh, being able to feel his presence a way that I've never felt it before. I've, I've faked being saved before, but I've never meant it. Mm -hmm. Until that day, I meant it. I've, I've always had the will, to, the want to change, but I've never had the will to change. Right. Um, a thing also that helped me out a lot too was getting into the RSAT program. Mm -hmm. They have the one-year drug program that they have up there at the county jail. Uh, our spiritual leader and also the the one that that runs the RSAT, Miss Lynette Gilmore. Mm -hmm. She is, like I said, she has been our spiritual leader along with the, our program leader. Mm -hmm. uh, she just, she is such a blessing. She knows how to bring out the best in right. people. Uh, she knows how to get it out of you. And she has been awesome. She has been amazing. The sheriff and the jail administrator and all the program coordinators up there they go above and beyond I, I've ever seen in any kind of law enforcement. They really, really care. They do. They show love, they show the compassion, mm -hmm. they show that they really care about people in general. It's not about just drug addicts or anything because I have no drug charges on my record. I probably got about 32, 35 felony record charges on my record. I've been turned down from drug programs because I have no drug drug felonies. Right. But if it hadn't have been for the drugs, you probably <clears throat> wouldn't have committed any of those crimes. Right. And they gave me a chance. And uh, I've become real close friends with the law enforcement here. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk to Walcott quite often, you know. <clears throat> We have some of the some of the cops stop at the Metamorphous House that I live at, the sober living house. They come by, and, you know. We've had barbecues up there. They've been mm -hmm. invited. They come hang out with us. It's been a. Uh, I feel sometimes like I told my dad. You know, God's been blessing me a lot, and I feel like I don't deserve none of it. I mean, I know I don't deserve none of it. And it's just hard to accept the blessings that he's been giving me. He's using you, though, to help other people. How is your relationship now that you have found God and uh, you are in sobriety with your mom and dad? <clears throat> my relationship with my mom and dad is... It's, it's a building relationship. You no, know, I haven't been a part of their life really and them being a part of mine because I've really pushed my parents and my family away right. a lot. So we really have not been connected as a family for almost 20 years. And uh, now we have a relationship. I actually, I, I love my mom and dad. Um, I've been mad at him for years. I actually, I was so mad at my mom and dad while I was in jail, while I was in Texas prison. And my son's 12 years old now. <clears throat> First time I got to see my son, really, when he was eight years old, when I got out of prison. Uh, my baby mama gave up her rights I wound up having to give up my rights to my son. I never got to see him. 
I was just so angry and so mad at him about it that I I don't know if I ever told my mom and dad this but I was so mad at him behind it I had no reason to be mad but I was so mad that I wanted to kill them both I had intentions when I got out of jail to come to the house and shoot both of them do they have your child? Mm -hmm. They actually adopted my son, and they, they raised him. I was, I was so angry and so pissed at them because they would not let me see my kid. But now you understand. I do understand. <clears throat> I understand the tough love. Mm. I've never understood that before. I, don't, I couldn't wrap my mind around tough love. Right. You either love me or you don't. Mm -hmm. If you love me, then you stick by my side no matter what I do. I could not wrap my mind around the tough love thing. Right. But I get it now. <clears throat> um, where do you? Where are you at uh, right now with God Time Ministries? I'm actually. <clears throat> I haven't been to one of the meetings yet. Um, same night that. The Got Time Ministries goes on at the same time. I'm actually in this manhood class. Mm -hmm. I went through it while I was in, <coughs> excuse me. I went through it already while I was in county jail, <coughs> but we were kind of rushed through it. So me and the guys that went through it, we're going through it again at a slower pace. <coughs> and it's gonna be like a 16 weeks out here. We've probably already got six weeks of it done already so until that's over with i can't really attend got time ministries but as soon as that's over with i've done talk to karen mills you know her and skip bell running on the outside mm -hmm. and i done told them you know as soon as this is over with then i'll be i'll be i'll be going to the meetings and everything but you know we have we have to go three meetings a week plus we have to call into the county jail every morning right to find out if we have to come in for piss test. Uh, plus, uh, you know, I work. I work my butt off. Um, me and a friend of mine that's actually in the program right now, Mike Dixon, uh, we're trying to get a business started, construction. construction. We're about to go to college in Texas County to get our construction license. Uh, we're doing this. It's not really just for us. I mean, it's it's for us to have something to survive on, but we're doing this because we feel as though, you know, we've been given so much that we want to give back. So we're trying to start this business for the, the guys and women that come out of the RSAP program. Mm -hmm. If you want it, you want the opportunity, right. you got a job when you get out. No Very questions good. asked. I mean, that's, that's our main motivation to doing this. So many struggle with finding employment when they do get out. Well, see, that, that's, that's the thing is you're not going to have to struggle. Right. As soon as you step out, you have a job if you want it. Mm -hmm. right? But there's going to be, <clears throat> there's going to be limitations and rules, you know, go back in for a sanction. Right. You might not have a job when you get out. Yeah. It depends on what you went in for. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have to keep your, keep your crap together. Right. You know, but it's just our our thing that we're wanting to do to give back, you know, try to help out. So. Where do you see yourself five years from now? Wow. <laughs> uh, okay, I definitely see that this business kicked off pretty good. I mean, you've come a <clears> long <throat> way. I appreciate it. You've come a long way. Um. I actually want to uh, get ordained as a minister. I don't really necessarily see myself behind a pulpit preaching. I don't think that's my ministry, really. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I really see myself, my ministry as being this this job that I'm I'm trying to build. Absolutely. Uh, you know, every morning before we. We go to work, we sit on the front porch at the Metamorphous House, we listen to Steve Furtick in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, drink our coffee, you know, visit a little bit. 
but we're definitely gonna build build the business in a Christian environment and use that as a ministry. Um, very good. Matt, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate y'all letting you me You've got come. an incredible story, and I know that you're going to reach out and help a lot of people to maybe not go down the same path that you went down, but you have walked a mile in the shoes, so you're able to help others. Well, thank you. And uh, I wish you the best on the, the construction business because... That will help uh, a lot of people and a lot of people in recovery coming out of prison and jail. Well, thank you. Okay. Really thank you very it. much. You too. Please support our sponsor, RenovationTea.com. You'll find a large variety from daily to specific herbal remedy teas, all certified organic and fair trade. Use code SHATTERED and you'll get a 10% discount. You can see the link below. Hi, I'm Dee. I'm the host of The Shattered Podcast. Please like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell on the notifications so you won't miss an episode. I'm very passionate about helping families. If you are an expert that would like to help or would like to share your testimony, please contact me. Thank you.